In any science-related field that involves chemicals or compounds or elements, the periodic table is a huge resource of information, and many people in the world don't really understand how much information is on the periodic table. So in this video, I'm going to kind of give you some tips on how much information you can really pull out of just this little table right here. So starting off, the periodic table is organized into groups and periods. Another word for groups would simply be columns. They're the same thing. And another word for periods would be rows. Okay, columns are the up and down, and rows are the left and right. Rows are horizontal, columns are vertical. So this guy right here, that is a column, ladies and gentlemen. And then this guy over here, that's a row. And they tell us something. The columns are actually, or the row, the groups, sorry, the groups group elements according to properties. So like everything in group number one has similar properties. Everything in group number two has similar properties. And everything in group number 18 has similar properties. And it has a lot to do with the number of outer level electrons called valence electrons, which we'll get to later in the video. The periods, on the other hand, are completely different. Okay, the periods tell you how many energy levels an atom has. And so if I'm in period number four, you count from the top. It goes one, two, three, four. Remember, horizontal columns. One, two, three, four. If I'm in period number four, that means that I'm going to have four energy levels. So any of these elements, I'm just, I just, I'm just going to pick one. Let's go with Krypton because it sounds cool and like Superman-ish. So Krypton, K-R, you write the symbol, and it's going to have four energy levels around it. And that tells you how many energy levels for your electrons. So if I ever ask you to draw an energy level diagram or to model an atom, you can start by drawing the number of energy levels around it, and then we would like kind of plot electrons after that. But just those two things tell you quite a bit about an element just by, you know, what group or period it's in. The periodic table also tells us the atomic number of an element. And the atomic number is actually the identity of an element. It's the number of protons. So write that down. The atomic number is the number of protons. And that is what determines the identity of an element. And as you can see in this first one here, the atomic number of helium is 2. And that is the identity. That's what makes helium helium because it has two protons. If I take a proton away it becomes hydrogen. It's no longer helium anymore. So the number of protons is the atomic number, and it determines the identity of an element. Now, there's something that kind of gets confusing on some periodic tables, and I want to explain it real quick, because sometimes on a periodic table, you might get something like this one on the bottom here, where you see this number 6 and this number 12.01, and you're like, well, which one is which? How do I know which one's the atomic number and which one's the atomic mass? Ugh. All right, well, it's always going to be the atomic, no, the smaller one is always going to be the atomic number. So it's always the smaller one. So make note of that, that if you see two numbers, it's always the smaller number. So in this case, six would be the atomic number of carbon. And that tells you that that carbon has six protons in it. And moving on to atomic mass, atomic mass is actually not just protons. It's the protons and the neutrons. So any nucleus doesn't have just protons. I mean, there's one isotope of hydrogen that just has a proton and no neutrons, but everything else that I know of has protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So when you add those two together, you get the mass number. So the mass number of four tells you that there are two protons and two neutrons in helium. Now you might be kind of asking yourself, well, Mr. Weiss, well, if, if, this is the atomic number, and that's the number of protons, then this is the atomic mass, and that's the protons and the neutrons, but does that mean there's like 0.01 neutrons? What? Well, it takes into account that there are different versions of these elements. So you remember in the video, or you remember in the past maybe at some point, that carbon has three different versions of itself. It has carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. We have a pretty good idea of how much of those types of carbon exists in nature, and if you were to average the masses of all of the known isotopes of those elements, you would get a decimal, which is that 12.01. So try not to let that confuse you too much, but this number 
right here, the 12.01, that's the atomic mass, the average atomic mass of the element. What you need to remember, though, is that the atomic mass, not the average atomic mass, but atomic mass in general, is the, the uh, number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Protons plus neutrons. Another thing the periodic table tells us about is reactivity. In general, as you move from left to right on the periodic table, draw yourself an arrow or something, as you move from left to right, reactivity is going to go down. Reactivity is going to go down. And so let me just kind of demonstrate this. In group one, all these elements, they're the alkali metals, they're incredibly reactive. If you put sodium or potassium or rubidium in water, it will literally catch on fire. Like it's that reactive. It reacts with the water and just boom, explodes. Now, on the other hand, elements over in group 18, the noble gases, you can't get them to react with anything. They have all the electrons they could ever want and they're completely fine. So as you move from left to right, elements gain electrons in their outer levels and they become a little bit more stable. Now this isn't always true. For example, chlorine and fluorine just rip electrons away from all kinds of things, which makes them very reactive. And so it's not completely true, you know, so reactivity doesn't always go down as you move from left to right, but in general, reactivity does decrease as you move from left to right on the periodic table. So if I were to point out, you know, an element, let's say like, I don't know, antimony. Is antimony stable, not stable? You would probably say, since it's kind of around over in this area towards this table side of the periodic table, that it's pretty stable, all right? But if you kind of pick an element around here like oxygen or fluorine, you're going to tell me, no, that's, that's not stable. Now, if you pick an element, let's say barium, okay? Is that reactive? Not reactive. It's pretty reactive because we're really close to group one, which I said was very, very reactive. Now, let's say I pick, I don't know, radon. Radon, eh, not, not reactive at all, okay, because it's, it's really in, it's in group 18, the noble gases, it's not reactive at all. So it gives you some information on reactivity and how reactive things are. The periodic table also gives us a great idea of how big elements are. So element number one, hydrogen, has one proton and usually one neutron, and it's not very big. It's the lightest, smallest element we know of. Element number 118, on the other hand, is the largest element we know of, has 118 protons, a whole bunch of neutrons, and it's just huge. And so as you move from left and down towards the right, size gets bigger. Size gets bigger as you move from the top down towards the right. And just look at the, uh, just look at the number, look at the atomic number. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 so on and so forth. As it goes up, the element is getting bigger, has more protons, more neutrons, etc., etc. The periodic table also tells us about valence electrons. Now, valence electrons are a new concept for some of you, but valence electrons are the very outermost level electrons of an atom. And so let's say an atom has three energy levels full of electrons. Well, the outer level are the, the valence electrons. So just kind of make note of that. Outer level equals valence electrons. The periodic table, for the most part, will tell us what the valence electrons are, how many there are. And so, for example, everything in group one has one valence electron. Everything in group two has two. All of these, the transition metals, we're going to skip. That includes these down here, the lanthanides and the actinides. We're going to skip because they can actually have more... They can have varying numbers of valence electrons, kind of confusing. And then we're going to go to this boron group here. These have three. These all have four. These all have five. Still going. Five. Six. Seven. And last but not least, the noble gases have eight except for helium, which only has two, but that's okay. And it tells you how many outer level electrons there are. This is really, really important because when we talk about bonding, things bond because they want to get a full outer level of valence electrons. You see, every element's goal in life is to get a full outer level, which is usually eight. 
And so let's say you are, I don't know, chlorine, and you have seven. You will do anything in your power to get one more electron. So chlorine, you might bond with sodium because sodium has one. And so you make that full level of eight, and you're completely stable and happy. In this video, you learned all kinds of things about the periodic table. So uh, as you go back and review, just kind of look at different elements and see if you can tell me what's the atomic number? What's the atomic mass? How many energy levels should this thing have? Um, how stable is it? Just by looking at the periodic table, you should be able to sort of know what those things are. So hope that was helpful. Take care.